Welcome to the first demo day of the Rue Institute Techstars Accelerator. Now, before I go any further, my dog did not eat my homework, but he did eat my glasses. So if anything goes wrong in the next hour and a half, it's the dog's fault. I was perfect before the dog did this to me. So I'm Lars Perkins, the managing director of the program, and the Rue Institute Techstars have collaborated to bring the Techstars Accelerator to Program to Maine as part of a broader mission to help foster economic development in Maine. Um, Techstars is the worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed, and our accelerator program will run annually, working with 10 companies each year, and each year will culminate, culminate in a demo day, like this. This is our first one. So there have been hundreds of Techstars demo days all over the world, but this is the first one ever in Maine. Okay, in a few minutes you'll be hearing from each of the 10 companies sitting over here that have completed the 13-week program. Uh, it reminds me, 13 weeks, it seems to have gone by in a flash, but as I recall, on the first day we were sitting over there with our toes in the sand, so uh, it really has been 13 weeks. So we've seen the full gamut of, uh, of Maine's weather climate. Um, you'll be hearing from 10 entrepreneurial teams teams that have abandoned sort of the more conventional, secure lifestyle for the crazy life of a startup entrepreneur. But they are not the only entrepreneurs in the, in the room. Others here have taken risks to bring their bold visions to reality, and we and the teams are just one of the beneficiaries of the hard work they've did, that they've done, starting with David and Barb Ruse, watershed, watershed investment to establish the Rue Institute. and there, you'll learn more about the Rue, but it's a, a world-class education research institute that acts like a startup. So, uh, as an aside, I never went to college, so uh, I'm self-taught and a big believer in experiential learning. That's the only way I've ever learned. And uh, I really, truly believe that um, things are happening at an exponential pace in the world and linear involve, uh, involvement of our evolution, linear evolution of our educational systems is not good enough. We need new approaches to education delivery that tightly integrate with the real world outside of academia but through partnerships and entrepreneurial programs like this one. So it's exciting to be a part of that because uh, that's exactly what the RU is doing. So on that subject, I'd like to introduce Margaret Angel who leads the RU's partnership efforts. Thank you, Lars. And thank you to the whole team that made this possible. Your leadership and hard work and dedication to launch this program has just been amazing to watch. Um, it is my distinct privilege and great joy to welcome all of you on behalf of Northeastern University to the first annual demo day of the Rue Institute Techstars Accelerator. Woo! I'm gonna take off my mask so you can see how big I'm smiling for this one. And I think I've got six feet. Um, so uh, at Rue, uh, in shorthand, our mission is to be an opportunity engine for the people of Maine. And this program and these founders exemplify that. These are 10 extraordinary founding teams who brought their passion and dedication and ambition to build something here. And on top of that, they happen to be a very fun and kind group of human beings. And it has been our pleasure to work alongside you on our campus for the last 13 weeks. Thank you for your energy and passion. And this program really is at the heart of our entrepreneurship uh, programming at the Rue Institute. Um, we, you know, we're aiming um, to make, to work with this community to make Maine the most exciting place to start a high growth technology driven company. And what that starts with is this community. We are building with you and building upon all the great work that exists here. 
like the companies like IDEX and WEX, companies uh, that we partner with at Rue. These are companies that started here and grew here um, to make Maine um, their home and to be anchors of this community. And our mission is to support the next generations of companies like that, um, that can be the anchors of the community, of our economic community, and, and maybe more importantly, more equitably distribute the power and the value of technology and science across our community. And so at Rue, we do that in our entrepreneurship programs in three ways. Uh, we have programs for people, uh, like our January and summer immersion programs. Uh, and in these programs, we have college, gra uh, college students, as well as recent college graduates, who, um, who come and, and work with us and think about starting their own company or joining a startup company that we work with. We have programs for networks, networks of investors and networks of mentors. Um, these, uh, we aim to basically create these networks so that we can rat match the right people with the right company at the right time to have incredible impact. Um, and then finally, we have programs for new ventures um, where we work with founders who want to put the foot on the gas pedal and get off the launch pad. Um, and so we feel like people, networks, and new ventures, we want to accelerate all three here in Maine. Uh, and we also believe, as Lars said, that the real power, the real differentiator, is we wrap all of that in Northeastern. Our students, our faculty, our research, and our global university network. And it was really fun to see that played out with this cohort. Uh, E-Squad did a project with our students here at Rue and also with some of our graduate students on our Seattle campus. Um, and Group B Labs and Omnic are exploring research uh, collaborations with Northeastern faculty. And then finally, through our partnerships uh, and our networks, we connected these 10 companies with over 650 different mentor opportunities with great people across the state, including people from Maine Health and the Portland Sea Dogs and Black-owned Maine. The last 22 months, it's been 22 months since we launched Rue in this very room, uh, the last 22 months have been a really hard and complicated time in the world. And it has been our distinct privilege to be part of a community that is focused on building focusing on supporting our learners, our innovators, our entrepreneurs, and really growing and building things here in our home state and community. And being part of that community is very special. Um, so my last order of business is to uh, introduce you to a really important member of that community. Rich Miner was one of our first and most enthusiastic mentors. Uh, Rich is the founder of Android, a dedicated and serial Techstars mentor, um, and a proud enthusiast for the startup community in Maine. Thank you, Rich, for everything you've done to help us launch this program. Thank you, Margaret. I don't quite have Margaret's smile, but I'm still gonna take my mask off, if I may. Let's see if I can get my mic settled. Uh, okay, so, um, as Margaret mentioned, I've, I've been a serial entrepreneur and a serial uh, mentor of Techstars. Uh, actually, for about 45 years, I've been involved either with my own startups or helping other people uh, with their startups. And I, I think, you know, looking out at the water here, maybe it's a little bit like the lobsterman who, while he's out on the water and he looks at his chart at the bottom of the sea, they say, this is where I want to put my traps. If, if I was a startup, the vibe that I have been getting from Portland for, for quite a while has been, if I was a startup, this is where I would want to be. And it has been that for a number of startups. You have IDEX, you have WEX and, uh, Dex and, uh, IDEX and many others. I'm sorry, you have WEX and IDEX and many others. Too many X's. Um, and, and I'm saying this a little bit as an outsider. I don't live in Maine. Uh, I've had a summer home here for about 20 years. Uh, but, you know, with my experience, I have seen startup ecosystems in the Bay Area, New York City, Boulder, where the first tech star started, uh, my hometown of Boston. And I have to say that the vibe here, especially with the development of the waterfront, all of the restaurants, the microbreweries, the micro distilleries, 
the strength of Maine's academic institutions, both, both public and private. To me, when I, when I look at Portland today, it, it just has to feel what Seattle felt like pre-Microsoft, you know, pre-Amazon. Pre and by the way, that kind of growth would come with complexity, so I'm not saying we should repeat all of that, but it is fertile ground, fertile water for the lobster and fertile ground for startups. And so about five years ago, I started thinking to myself, how, how do we try and foster more innovation in this city? And I actually reached out to Brad Feld and David Cohen. They're the two founders of the original Techstars in Boulder and are still heavily involved today, and started talking to them about what I see in Portland. And they were interested in the Techstars Portland. But it wasn't until I, I met Dave Rue, uh, and this was about five or six years ago, and he was just starting to think, I believe, about what he wanted to do here with the Rue Institute, was just talking to others about thoughts and ideas, and I really encouraged him uh, sort of as Lars said, you need that combination of academic institution tied close to industry, and not just what academics spin out of that academic institution, but invite others in to be close by. And, and I was very happy to see, as a result of that, uh, this marriage between the RU and Techstars. Because to have a vibrant tech ecosystem, you need not only that strong educational institution, you need a lot of other factors. You need the IDEXs and the WEXs and the other companies, you know, to, because they provide acquisition opportunities for some of those startups. They also, quite frankly, piss off some of their employees who decide to leave and become some of those next startups that are happening inside of the community. Uh, they become mentors, right? And then you also need investment, which I'm happy to see a number of my friends from the VC community out here in the audience as well. And so all of that has to come together as it has between Rue and Techstars, but also accelerated with just this amazing partnership that, that Rue had with Northeastern and the effort that they put in and how quickly and efficiently they've moved. So the only remaining piece that we needed was a great leader. And here again, I was really proud to know Lars, know Lars was in Maine, be able to connect Lars to the Rue and just see, you know, again, knowing in my core that it felt like a good partnership his vision, his drive, his background as an entrepreneur and as a mentor, um, and, and, and it's blossomed into what we have in this first cohort. I hope as you see the demos that you also see that in them as well. So now there's only one other important component that you need in this ecosystem, and that's strong leadership from local and top government. And so here again, Lars and I had the pleasure this summer of meeting with Governor Mills, and during that meeting and the meeting since then, I've just been continually impressed with her understanding of the elements that you need to catalyze innovation. And we talk a lot about higher education, but she gets it's not just higher education, you need strong K-12, right? They're the ones feeding a lot of those students into the local state school system for higher ed. They also, if you're gonna attract talent, you need to convince people this is where they wanna raise their families and you need that K-12 education there as well. You need, you need housing opportunities. Uh, and housing is not just housing for those employees who are gonna come in, but it's also for the real estate for the development of those companies. Uh, you need high-speed broadband, again, for learning, for education, for those families to wanna come here and then to be able to thrive here. Again, the governor's been strong in that. And then build on anchor industries, both established ones like the working waterfront we have before us, uh, but also uh, pharma and tech, again, some of, which is, uh, some of which have been here, but some of which the governor realized that we also need to attract here. So I was just impressed with how bright and energetic uh, she was, and she's a model leader for the state, and I am very happy now to turn the podium over to Governor Janet Mills. I'm shorter than Rich. <laughs> thank you, Rich, and thank you, Lars, and thank all of you for being here. Listen, I just want to give a few words of welcome, because I know everybody's anxious to get started on the pitches, and uh, I, too, am, am eager to listen to the uh, startups make their pitch and learn all about the exciting things you've been doing for the last 13 weeks. And it's an honor to join the Rue Institute and Techstars to celebrate the culmination of the Rue Institute's Techstars Accelerator. Uh, Rich and Margaret mentioned that there's been a pretty tough 22 months 
for everybody across the world, across the globe, in Maine in particular, with an aging population that we have and with a rural uh, population that we have, it's been really tough to coordinate everything we needed to do to combat the dangerous, deadly uh, coronavirus and its Delta variants, but we're doing that. And I am proud to say, <laughs> I'm proud to say just a few minutes ago, I did hear that our FEMA application, which was just submitted like uh, two days ago, the, the federal government has responded and they're sending a team of doctors and nurses to Maine tomorrow to help with our backlog. Well, I was here, last time I was in this building was a year ago, September, uh, two years ago maybe. 76 students stood on the, uh, at the start of unlimited promise and possibility little uncertainty. In the inaugural of the Rue Institute, there was no path to follow because they were all making the path. You all are making paths. Well, when the Rue Institute was formed in 2020, our economy appeared to be doing pretty well in many respects, although we had a lot of challenges, workforce particularly, shortage of qualified, skilled workers, and a lack of diversification. Those things loomed large. But we, uh, my administration, headed by Heather Johnson, Commissioner Heather Johnson of the De Department of Economic and Community Development, developed a 10-year economic plan for the state, with the cornerstone of that plan being to attract 75,000 people to our workforce within the next few years. The creation of the Rue Institute, which would prepare our workers for the jobs of the future, was welcome news and a certain, uh, f something that fit the bill. Then there was the global pandemic. And, uh, if we needed you before the pandemic, we certainly need you now. My, my administration is currently implementing the main jobs and recovery plan so we can use something like $25 million in federal funds, the American Rescue Plan funds, to stabilize our economy and invest in research and development, spur economic growth in the short term and long term, getting people back to work in good paying jobs across all industries, including the trades and technology and healthcare and education. And we're calling on everybody, because this is an all hands on deck challenge. Small business, large business, higher ed institutions, local state government, working together. And that's why the Rue Institute is so important. Now they have 317 students enrolled in the Rue Institute, and that number's gonna grow in January. Well, and that wouldn't have happened without the Rue Institute's more than 90 world-renowned research and learning, learning directors, faculty, and staff, more than 80 public and private entities who have partnered with the Institute. It is all hands on deck, and it shows, and today is great progress. So today we celebrate the innovation of the Rue Institute by making the culmination of 13 weeks of intensive training and hands-on mentorship, making that uh, a celebration today. 10 startups, 10 tech startups, chosen from a diverse field of, of applicants, from Chile to Seattle, to Maine, and everywhere in between. They spent three months learning how to grow their business as part of the Tech Stars Accelerator, and to sh today they'll share their stories. I just want to welcome them and say, you know, you've all worked hard for this day, but your work is far from over. Our state, our nation, and our world need you. We need your talents, your passion, your dedication to, a, to create a brighter, fairer future. And I hope, Wherever you're from, whether you're from here, from another state or another country, whether you intend to leave and come back or not leave it at all, after finishing this program, I hope your future certainly includes the state of Maine. I am pleased to hear, oh yeah, sure, you can go. <laughs> I'm pleased to know that four companies have already committed to relocating in Maine already. That's huge news. And for any others that may be considering that move, I say to you, we stand ready to help. The state of Maine wants to be your partner. We want you here and we'll work with you as hard as possible to bring you here and keep you here. My administration will support innovators to put down roots here in Maine, and there is both federal and state funding available for businesses, for technical assistance, for training, for research, uh, capital, startup costs, and remote work. As an example, a quasi-state agency, the Maine Technology Institute, awarded three quarters of a million dollars to support the Rue Institute venture creation and acceleration platform. 
That's a robust venture creation and acceleration program designed to position Maine as the most exciting place to start a high growth venture, focused on advanced life sciences, artificial intelligence, data and computer sciences, sustainability, and the modernization of natural resources. The Maine Venture Fund will also work with tech stars to support businesses with equity funding. And we offer programs like the Maine Seed Capital Tax Credit to, for an incentive for investors. These are some of the best in class programs designed to encourage innovation and growth in Maine and we continue our efforts to expand our workforce to make sure startups like yours have the skilled workers you need and the tech environment, the hub as it were, that we're developing to make you uh, comfortable here. Two years ago, students at the Rue Institute stood at the start of unlimited promise and possibility, and not a little uncertainty. But despite a global pandemic, the Rue Institute has proven its potential, attracting talented people, innovative businesses, and powerful ideas to Portland and to our state. I look forward to hearing the demo pitches. And I encourage all investors listening to honor the hard work of these innovator, innovators who I think are at the heart of the state of Maine. But what does this all mean? Last summer, when I met with Rich and others, they recommended I read a book called Jump Starting America. I read it, dutifully. It's two years out, a little out of date, but it's still valid. And it talks about how you start a hub tech center, a tech hub. And it talks about the amenities that a community needs, Amenities, education, higher ed, technology, house prices, low crime rates, low commuting, commuting times. Uh, I think I see where we're talking about here. I think we have it here. We're a small state, but we're a creative state. We have had creators, last Saturday, I marched in the Chester Greenwood Parade. We all wore earmuffs because 120 years ago, Chester Greenwood in Farmington, Maine invented earmuffs and steel tin, tin rakes and matchbooks with advertising. Well, were he here today, he'd love to hear the pitches of these 10 startups. And then we have David Rue, Maine born and bred from Lewiston. And <laughs> is there a Rue person in the, in the room? Um, but the point is, if you stay here for even an hour or a day or a week, you can walk down Congress Street in Portland, or Commercial Street in Pro Portland, or Lisbon Street in Lewiston, or Main Street in Bangor, and you'll find a nice quiche dish, or avocado sandwich, or Magadushu mag mag pastry, or a lobster roll, or even a PB&J sandwich, whatever your choice, and a good craft beer. We are a small state, but we are nimble, and we welcome you. And when you move here, live here, visit here, you will walk down the street and you will find compatriots, you will find peers, you will find people to talk to about research and development at the Jackson Laboratories, at the Bigelow Labs, at the UNE, at UNE where they're studying fleas and pain control, uh, you know, at uh, Gulf of Maine Research Institute just down the street, and the University of Maine's Advanced Structures and Composites Center where they're inventing new ways to do offshore wind and bridges in a backpack and cross-laminated timber designs and many, many patents. So exciting. About 25 years ago, there was this movie. It's called As Good As It Gets. Helen Hunt, Jack Nicholson. I don't know if you remember. And it's about a relationship that's fraught with a bit of friction and attraction, both. And at one point, Helen Hunt tries to get Jack Nicholson to say something really good about her. It's really like pulling teeth for him. He's kind of an ornery character. Finally, he says to her, you make me want to be a better man. I say to those who invest here, who want to invest here, who want to move here, live here, contribute to our economy, our well-being, we will contribute to yours, and you make us want to be a better state. And we will, and we are a better state. Keep it going, keep it up. I heard somebody say, I like Portland, it's so close to Boston. Somebody said, I like Brunswick, it's close to Boston. You know what, in a few years, people in Boston are gonna say, come here and live in Boston because we're so close to Portland. Thank you.
happens when you let an amateur mic himself. Well, thank you, Governor. What a sign that uh, the governor of the state should turn out and see a, our little class of 10 startups. It's just, I love Maine. You know, you can still move the meter and, and get the support that matters when you're trying to do innovative things. And I'm, I guess I'm taller than the governor. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Techstars, for those that you don't know about it. Uh, Techstars is the worldwide accelerator that helps entrepreneurs succeed. We run over 50 accelerators across the globe, Fort New York, Los Angeles, Austin, Texas, Dubai, Paris, and now Portland, Maine. <laughs> yes, Portland, Maine. Now, one of my goals is to stop having to say Maine every time. Oh, now I get to think, ah, oh, look at this. Now it'll get easy. Uh, <clears throat> so one of my goals is to stop saying Maine every time I say Portland, because everyone will know that Portland, Maine is the Portland when it comes to technology. <laughs> okay, so each year, uh, thousands of companies apply to be part of a Techstars Accelerator. And depending on the location, either 10 or it's between 10 and 24 are selected. So thousands of applications, only a few selected. Here in Maine, we had uh, hundreds of applications. We talked to almost 100 companies. And from those 100, we selected the 10. It's a very selective process. Um, I'm also happy to say that uh, during the selection that uh, we ended up with uh, nine out of the 10 companies have founders from uh, typically underrepresented groups uh, in the venture finance community of entrepreneurship. So that's. So Techstars has a model for acceleration that's tried and true, and it works. Uh, over the years, over two and a half thousand companies have graduated from our programs. Eighty-three percent of them are still in business or have been acquired. Eighty-three percent. Contrast that to the success rate of, of entrepreneurs and tech startups generally. In aggregate, they've raised over 15 billion in funding. And there are amongst them 14 unicorns, companies with a value of more than a billion dollars, and blank listed public companies. I'm supposed to fill that in. Uh, Nancy, how many public companies do we have? Four. Four pu listed public companies amongst those. Thank you. That was, that was like, a, it's like a game show. I, I had to, <laughs> to ask for a. a but uh, another game show, as opposed to Shark Tank, the companies do not compete with each other for the funding. Once they come to the program, we want all 10 of them to succeed. We have invested already not just the time, but also actually invest money in these companies. So being selected by the Techstars program into a program like this, um, it's not a selection process after you're here. It's now about taking advantage of the resources to become successful. Um, as Rich said, I'm an entrepreneur myself. I'm building companies in the Boston area, selling our company to Google, where I met Rich, and then advising and investing in smaller companies. And now I can do that, which is the thing I love to do the most. It's my day job. Um, I get a steady paycheck. And I, I do it in the state that I love and where I've owned a home for, for, for 25 years and where we've lived. My, me and my wife have lived permanently for the past three. So our program, <clears throat> what happens during those 13 weeks? Our program is mentor-driven. So at, they're, at the heart of it, they're people who are investing time in just helping companies. They do it, uh, I'm looking at Greg, I see mentors in the, in the audience here. Just, uh, uh, just so many folks, their names are up here, it's too many to thank all at once. Or, but uh, there's 75 of them, each of which I'm going to tell you about now. No, I won't do that. <laughs> uh, there's too many to thank individually, but I want to say a big thank you, and not nearly big enough to all of our mentors, who at the start just come in, have a 15-minute meeting with each company. So from the company standpoint, for two weeks back to back, they're doing nothing but telling the story over and over to 75 mentors and listening to the response. That's what's really at the core. And they, 
you know, the stories, uh, you know, evenings on Thanksgiving Day over the weekend, mentors just with nothing to gain other than the satisfaction of helping uh, are reaching out and, and, and helping these young companies along their path. It's, it's lifelong relationships are, are made while mentors, these mentors help open doors and provide advice that would really be hard for a startup to have access to under normal conditions. So there are too many to thank. I need to single out three who have given above and beyond. Well, there's many who have given above and beyond, but three in particular that sort of kick-started the program when there was no program. They were part of the program before there was a program. One you know, um, Rich. Uh, so but these, these are folks who have helped run uh, workshops, have run forums for our CTOs and um, other senior execs in the companies and have all lead mentored not one, but multiple companies. Um, so thank you, Rich Miner, and, and Andy Palmer, who is not here, is a board meeting, and Ali Goldstein, I know, is here also. With, without you folks, we would have uh, not got off the lift path. And I'm, I'm, not going, this is, I'm not going to single out Bob Metcalf, because I know he wanted me to do that. <laughs> so I'm not going to single him out as someone who's been an indefatigable supporter of uh, this endeavor of Maine and of me, and I'm not going to thank him from the bottom of my heart because he wouldn't like that. <laughs> we, also run over, we also run over 30 workshops from financial modeling to leadership and culture, which ran with Margaret's husband, Nate Fick. Um, all designed to prepare the companies for life beyond the program, and I want to thank all of you who participated in organizing and, and delivering those uh, workshops. We also have about a dozen founders that come in and tell their origin stories. These are off the record evening conversations uh, with the group, no tweeting, no blogging, where we can hear the stories of, of success or not success unvarnished, as opposed to um, the fairy tale success stories that you read about in the paper where it looks easy. Building a company is not easy. It's a lot harder than it looks. So I'd like to thank those founders who contributed their time to be a part of that. We also have a network of global, a global network of partners who provide free or subsidized services. And what surprised me is the people that are doing this are entrepreneurs themselves. So they're not just pitching technology, but they're actually rolling up their sleeves and mentoring these companies because they've been it through them themselves. And their way of giving back is go work for a larger organization and do outreach to the entrepreneurial community. So thank you to all our global network partners. <clears throat> so long-term economic development in Maine is the goal that we all share. We share it with the real, we share it with the governor and the leadership of the city. Um, and this is our first year that we had pretty modest expectations. Uh, we only had one company that was actually from Maine over there and nine others who we just wanted to give a great experience of Maine to. So they go home, and if they think about expanding their companies, they think about Maine. If they weren't talking to their friends, they would say Maine's a great place to start a company. That's what we hope to give them, but we underestimated the impression Maine would make on them. So in addition to Omnic, as the governor said, we have four companies that have decided to locate here, and another three who have said they would love to be here. We'll hear a little bit more about that, uh, even if, it's circ circum if the circumstances permitted. So uh, just an extraordinary impact the city had and the state had. Uh, and it was a lot of fun to, to see that happen. Um, I hope you get to know them later on at the, at the reception and you can hear some of the stories they have. Um, Mainers, you know, even though they're from away, I'm from away too, uh, Mainers opened their arms time and time again to help out. These serendipitous meetings, we have a guy who has pitched in to help the companies who just happens to be the neighbor of one of the uh, CEOs and the temporary housing that they found during the program. Um, he's been uh, an airport picker-upper, a car lender, uh, an accountant. Uh, <laughs> we call him, <clears throat> he's called John the Neighbor. <laughs> and he's now an honorary uh, member of the cohort. Uh, we're even giving him access to our Slack channel because we need him. The, the, the programs uh, that the governor talked about, uh, Maine Technology Institute, Maine Venture Fund, uh, Startup Investment Tax Credit, we heard, learned about these things during the program, and I, I learned about them in more detail than I knew, and these things really made a difference. 
they really make a difference. And I remember one of the CEOs coming up to me after one of the presentations and saying, is it just gonna get better every single day? Because they, they kept hearing more and more. Um, so I wanna say a big thank you to Maine, uh, both to the people of Maine, to Portland, the city, and to these wonderful programs that entice companies to locate here. So thank you, Maine. Now we have to So Techstars runs over 50 accelerators, <clears throat> and they sometimes do it in, in conjunction with partners. Um, this is the first time we've had a Techstars accelerator whose partner is an educational institution. And the Rue uh, and Northeastern have provided so much support. Uh, Margaret talked about the companies that are collaborating on research, research and initiatives and also co-op students. Uh, the, the gamut from extremely sophisticated research opportunities down to just co-op coming in and helping day-to-day uh, -day at a subsidized rate, thanks to the Harold Alphon Foundation. Um, <clears throat> so I want to say uh, just a fantastic, great thank you to the Rue Institute for helping to make this work. It, it wouldn't be fair <clears throat> if I didn't mention one person who was instrumental at in making this program come together, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, but I'd like to say a special thank you to Chris Wolfel, who's Rue's Director of Entrepreneurship, and himself, a Techstars founder, uh, for his support and leadership. So just thank you, Chris, if you're watching the live stream. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank the D Design and Business Associates who have joined us during the program. They are with us only for the duration of the program, for three months. I told them the pay is poor, there's no hope of advancement, and you have to do anything from designing logos to getting food to herding cats. I love cats, but. Um, <clears throat> all of them are looking for their next opportunity beyond Techstars, and so if you get a chance to meet them during the reception and know a way to help them along their path, it's greatly appreciated. They've been wonderful, exceptional, and the program would not have been possible without them. I said finally, but after finally comes lastly. So lastly is one person in particular with whom this program would never have happened. Others have worked hard to, to bring the program and the environment together so it could happen. But there's one person who has made it happen every day, kept everything moving smoothly. Those of you who know me personally know this has been a very challenging year for me and my family. And this person has carried a lot of my water and tirelessly ensured that the program has run perfectly. His name is Santiago Zadel, our program manager. And I'd like Santi to come up. Santi. Up the stairs. Thank you. Um, and that is a gift from me, Lars, not tech stars to you, Santi. A personal thank you for everything you've done. Oh, cool. I can do this again. Oh. Okay, now on to the companies. But first, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Miles O'Brien, six time Emmy award winning journalist, science correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, one of my closest friends, um, and pretty much one of the top five one handed, uh, one armed journalists I know. Um, <clears throat> Miles has generally off generously offered to help me master these ceremonies. Okay, now on to the companies. The first company we're going to hear from is uh, Listed B, who is bringing the Black Beauty experience online. Royden? Let me tell you a bit about my experience. You see, growing up, barbershops and salons have always been revered establishments in my neighborhood because these are places you can always count on to make you look and feel good. I remember getting my first haircut when I was five years old. And ever since then, 
I've been obsessed with the transformation and empowerment that it creates in our community. Did you know that black people spend more than $70 billion every year on beauty services alone? Because physical appearance is a deeply embedded element of our culture. It's the way we communicate and interact with each other. However, nearly $3 billion in revenue is lost annually because of the inconvenience of finding and booking professionals. Now, why is that? Well, despite the fact that there are roughly 1 million black beauty and wellness professionals in America today, more than 80% of them do not have an online booking solution and are still relying on word of mouth and labor intensive processes to grow and manage their business. Existing solutions are missing that social element, which is a key component found in black barbershops and salons. And that is part of the reason why professionals are so apprehensive about migrating their business online. But without an online solution, not only are professionals losing revenue by not maximizing bookings, but clients are struggling to find the right professionals in their local area for the services they want. For example, when my co-founder and I first came to Portland, Maine, can you imagine that it took us over six weeks to find a barber that we trust to cut our hair? Because our culture depends on visuals when making beauty service decisions. Black beauty and wellness professionals need an online solution, but one that mimics the real world experience to create and foster relationships. My name is Royden Jeffrey, and I am the CEO of Listed B. Listed B is a social booking app for beauty and wellness services within the black community. Our technology uniquely helps the one million professionals to be discovered by the 50 million African Americans who need their services. In just three simple steps, users can find a style they like, connect with a local professional, and schedule an appointment. Most black barbershops and salons encapsulate a culture where people gather to laugh, learn, entertain, bond, and of course, conduct business. Our goal is to bring this unique culture online to build trust in the community and to enhance the booking experience through social engagement with photos and videos. We know that this is the solution our users need because despite the market research that we've done in New York, since coming to Portland, we've developed a partnership with Black Old Maine, giving us access to more than 15,000 professionals and clients who are ready to join our community. Now, when it comes to our superstar team, it consists of myself, a lifelong entrepreneur with a passion for beauty and wellness dedicated to the success of black business owners, and Taj English, a veteran technologist with senior experience working with startups as small as two people to major corporations like Salesforce. Now, when it comes to our business model, the way we make money is we charge a monthly subscription to the professionals as well as a booking fee to the clients for every scheduled appointment. Now is the best time to build Listed B because as the world begins to open back up from the pandemic, physical appearance is once again at the forefront of most people's lives. We envision a world where Listed B is driving the largest black community within the global beauty and wellness space. But in order to do so, we must accelerate and transform the industry by making meaningful connections today. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Right, right. Nicely done. Knocked you out of the park there. So uh, you and Taj found a good barber in Maine, <laughs> and so you're going to stay. Is that the deal? I mean. So we're staying an extra week. So the partner. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get one more cut. <laughs> Just to get one more cut. Um, no, so the partnership that I mentioned with Black Owned Maine, um, they're hosting a beauty event on the 18th. And we figured it made more sense to just stick around than to go back to New York and only to come back in about three days for this event. So we decided to stick around. Lucky enough, we found John the Neighbor who decided to host us for free. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll be staying with John the Neighbor. So yeah, shout out to John the Neighbor. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so suffice to say, you, you, you felt 
surprisingly welcomed in Maine? Oh yes, certainly. Um, so when we decided to go out into the community and talk to people, we were so welcomed. Everyone was so friendly. Compared to New York, Taj and I, we got kicked out of so many barbershops. Um, people ignored us. They thought we were crazy. But we were 11 for 11 when we decided to go out into Portland, Westbrook, and some of the other cities here. Everyone welcomed us, and it was amazing. Yeah. All nice. right. Well, good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we have Circa. Uh, she and Leslie and her team have built a, payment flex, a flexible payment system that keeps people in their homes rather than getting evicted while simultaneously improving the bottom line for property owners. Leslie. Hi, I'm Leslie. I'm the CEO of Circa. And I'm here because we reinvented rent. By removing, removing friction, payment friction, we help people stay in their homes. At the same time, we increase the collection of rent and improve the bottom line for property owners. But before I delve into the numbers, let me introduce you to Ariana. Ariana lives in a mobile home in upstate New York. She's a teacher, so money's always been tight. And she's pregnant. But with just one more doctor's visit, something had to give. And that's where we came in. Because of Circa, Ariana didn't have to choose between her baby's health or a roof overhead. Here's what that looks like. Circa sends Ariana a notification. Ariana opens her app. And she chooses to split her payment into two. She'll pay an extra $5 per transaction. But she didn't have to borrow from a friend, and she didn't have to go to a payday lender. Ariana is not an outlier. Over the course of my career, I've managed large call centers, and the pain of paying bills is universal. But what I heard over and over is, I just need a little more time. Of the 44 million households that rent in America, Consistently, one out of three rent payments come in late. And 50%, over 50%, come up short every one month every year. So that means that the 11 million property owners in America are chasing $15 billion of late rent payments every month. Let's look at our results. Across the 14 communities that we're in today, we've already increased the collection of rent from those who regularly paid late. And we boosted the collection of arrears, those who hadn't paid for months, by 4x. So we made it easier and less expensive for property owners to collect rent and arrears than to evict. This matters because there are 3.5 million households at risk of eviction today. That's seven evictions a minute for the next year. Circa is really important. It's a huge win for property owners and for their communities. And the benefit to the properties far outweighs the $1 per unit per month that we charge. In fact, they earn new revenue because we share those transaction fees. Yeah, this industry is not exactly known for innovation. But because of our win-win model, we actually have properties coming to us asking to work with Circa. We're already in New York. We're in Ohio. We've started to onboard a national property with over 11,000 units. And of course, we're expanding here in Maine, where we are establishing our new headquarters. Yay! <laughs> yeah, this is the time for Circa, and we are the team. We have experience in financial operations, in payment technology, in rent and real estate, and in financial inclusion. And we're all completely obsessed with stories like Ariana's, because we know they echo what's true. There are no higher stakes than keeping a roof overhead. Flexibility, choice, and mutual respect. This is how we build stronger communities through payment innovation. 
Thank you. Thank you. Hey, High five. God. Killed it. Um, you know, the first time we talked, way back in April, I started saying, okay, so the tenant pays this and the landlord receives this, and he said, no. The, the renter pays this and resident. the property, resident, resident. Sorry, the resident pays this and the property owner receives this. It was changing the language. That seems like a pretty conscious move and you taught me the new words. You know, yep. we, well, we, we care about mutual respect, we care about people, and we think language matters. So we're, yeah, we're very serious about the language that we use. Maybe you should get rid of rent. Call it something else, huh? <laughs> don't, don't get me started. <laughs> so I, I, I can imagine there are plenty of residents who uh, would go to their property owners and say, give me Circa. Uh, does it work the other way around, too? Are the property owners as interested? Well, we, we've had many property owners interested, mostly because we're saving them time and increasing their bottom line. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty easy story to tell. When you go to a, a particularly someone in real estate and say, we'll make your bottom line better, we can collect arrears that you can't collect today. It's a good story. So what drew you to Maine? <laughs> so I, we've had a house in Maine since, since I was a child. I love Maine. Um, we, we, but I knew Maine as a, a place for vacation. Now I know Maine as a place for business. And it's been incredible. And I, we felt, as a company, welcomed. Like, welcome to help investors invest. Welcomed by people, welcomed by property owners. Yeah, we, we want to be here. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you, Leslie. Congratulations. <laughs> Another global tech star's perk hugs from the governor. Uh, this is an easy one to introduce. I'm going to introduce a husband and wife team, Ily and Olivia Eisner, who have reinvented the baby bottle. Thank you, guys. Ready? Did you know that a parent loses an average of 44 days of sleep in their baby's first year? <laughs> Do you remember waking up at 3 a.m. to the sound of a screaming baby? Do you remember how helpless and inadequate you felt as a parent? When our daughter was an infant and my wife was pulling off 24-hour shifts at the hospital, I was left with the onerous task of bottle feeding. On those nights, I'd wake up multiple times to feed our daughter and quickly learned that taking a bag of cold breast milk, pouring it into a bottle, and attempting to warm it while holding a screaming baby was an utterly miserable experience. Milk would inevitably spill everywhere, warming took forever, and the temperature was never right. Night after night, I found myself wishing that at the push of some magical button, I could quickly feed my daughter and get the heck back to sleep. A complete lack of acceptable solutions to frustrating middle of the night and on the go feedings drove us to invent that magical button, which we call Bubby. Bubby is an advanced baby bottle. <laughs> that keeps breast milk or formula cold for hours, and then, at the push of a button, warms it to the perfect feeding temperature within two minutes. With Bubby, there are no risks of hot spots or denaturing the vital nutrients of breast milk. Best of all, baby can be fed directly from Bubby, which is portable, battery-powered and rechargeable, is capable of dispensing formula, and works with all popular nipple brands. Bubby's uniquely integrated sensors also allow it to collect valuable feeding data which it can transmit wirelessly to a mobile app for convenient viewing. My name is Illy Eisner. I'm a computer engineer, technical co-founder, and CEO of Group B Labs. I have over a decade of experience working on consumer devices. Hi, I'm Olivia Eisner, co-founder, chief clinical officer, and I happen to be this guy's wife. I am also a nurse practitioner, a certified nurse midwife, and a board-certified lactation consultant. 
It may come as a surprise that something like Bubby doesn't already exist, but there's good reason for that. Figuring out how to keep breast milk fresh for hours and then heating it quickly and safely was a huge challenge. You see, breast milk is full of vital nutrients and antibodies that easily break down when overheated, something that occurs regularly on a stovetop, in a microwave, and even in a bottle warmer. Our research confirms that one out of five parents regularly use inappropriate warming methods that easily destroys the best qualities of breast milk and can pose a burn risk to the child. Bobby reflects over 18 months of research and development that culminated in our invention of a vacuum insulated flask and integrated heating mechanism that's with sensors that not only monitor for heat gradients, but also measure liquid volume and precise temperature, something that hasn't been achieved in a vacuum insulated bottle until now. Today, we have a working prototype, three patents granted, three additional patents pending, and our beautiful industrial design was a finalist in the 2021 Red Dot Design Awards. Bubby is a premium baby product and costs $180 for a kit. But with the average premium product costing about $270, it is attractively positioned at the lower end of that price spectrum. Additional revenue mo opportunities include feeding accessories, subscription to a feeding data and insight app, and subscription to home delivery of pre-measured formula pods. The total addressable market for premium baby products in the US is about $1.2 billion. But Bubby will launch strategically through direct-to-consumer e-commerce website, while also being rolled out regionally through boutique physical retailers. Bubby is more than just a pretty face. It redefines a product category that's barely changed in the past century. As a matter of fact, 72% of the parents we surveyed felt that Bubby was a significant improvement over options available on the market today. Bubby finally revolutionizes the baby bottle in a way that alleviates parental stress and anxiety, elevates the caregiver experience, all while optimizing baby's nutrition and safety. With Bubby, parents can get back to what's really important, cuddling, playing peekaboo, and heck, maybe even a good night's sleep. <laughs> Uh, great job. Perfect. Thank you. Good job, Bubby. So, Thank you. You know, they say you shouldn't uh, cry over spilled milk, but you can't turn it into a business, evidently, right? Uh, but I'm curious, what's harder, um, raising the baby or doing a startup? Hands down, being a parent. The, the baby. <laughs> Any day of the week. <laughs> yeah. This has been a nice break from the parenting. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Speaking of breaks, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> kids, kids will make you run around a little, won't they? They, they will. I mean, who knew? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm using notes, but I made everybody get off script. You can tell how good they are, just not knowing their pitches. But Ely was a little late, so we had to give him some encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> Tough love. <laughs> so what's next for the business? Well, Manufacturing and bringing it to market. Absolutely, trying to help all those parents out there who are probably gonna go through the same struggles that we went through. Unfortunately, this is a bit too late for us, so maybe we'll use it for coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When my kids were young, it was the diaper genie. I think this is gonna be just as good at baby showers, don't you think? Maybe just. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just, just one more question. Who's doing your taxes this year? Oh, John the neighbor. <laughs> Thank you. Got it. Uh, next, uh, we all know with the pandemic, we're spending hours and hours and hours looking at screens. Um, we're more stressed out than ever before. And the next company um, has found a way to integrate mindfulness and breathing exercises into your daily work experience to help reduce stress and make you happier. Hannes. Hi, I'm Hannes Bent, the founder and CEO of Breathing AI. We're a digital health startup providing relaxing screen experiences to reduce stress and improve performance. The average screen time per person is at an all-time high, with 11 hours per day, more than the time we spend with our loved ones. Breaks are becoming less common, and 77% of screen users feel burned out. <clears throat> Currently, the screens don't adapt to us. We have to adapt to them. And I myself 
felt burned out, anxious, depressed, and disconnected for many, many years until I discovered breathwork and mindfulness, and these practices transformed my life. I started teaching yoga and breathwork extensively to help others, but I wanted to have a larger impact. That's why I partnered with top researchers and my mentor, Wim, the Iceman Hoff, to pioneer award-winning digital health technologies we presented at Stanford and Harvard. Unfortunately, they too required additional screen time. After a lot of experimenting and user surveys, Breathing AI was born in the summer of 2020, when the pandemic spotlight employee burnout as a global concern. Over the last two months alone, over nine million employees quit their jobs, mostly related to stress. And pre-pandemic already, over 20% of companies' direct expenses, over $300 billion, were directly related to employee stress, and that number is only increasing. Talking about stress, I'd like to invite you to take a short, mindful break and experience firsthand one of the core features of our product. Just bringing awareness to your seat, maybe gently closing your eyes, bringing awareness to your breath. It's trying to take your deepest inhale of today with a bright smile. And just a letting go exhale, dropping your shoulders. No sense how you're feeling now. Now imagine, how would it feel to have such experiences throughout your workday? How? Through a fully personalized and patented Chrome browser extension. Breathing AI uses machine learning to understand what is most relaxing for you and whether that is a personalized calming screen color or a gentle reminder to take a deep breath when you need it most or soothing background sounds. Our product allows the screens to adapt to your well-being without additional screen time or wearables. We have shown that our science-based beta product works and have received amazing user feedback. We currently have five employee wellness pilots with institutions such as Columbia University and one of the top five healthcare providers in the US. We offer it as enterprise sales for an, as an employee wellness program and as a freemium model for individual consumers. The global digital health market is 222 billion in 2021 and is forecast to reach 561 billion in 2025. Employee wellness programs have shown an ROI of $5 in improved health and productivity for each dollar spent. And we see our direct operational market size in the 1.2 billion um, dissatisfied consumers and companies. And dissatisfied with the current digital health offerings because they're seeking a simple, seamless solution just like ours. And our, while our current focus is to perfect the existing product and to learn from the data, AI, and UX, our vision is to keep innovating through patented features such as personalized audio and olfactory devices. We strive to be the company for adaptive technologies centered around your well-being. Wellness made easy in the blink of an eye with a deep breath and a smile. And uh, my thank you, my deepest gratitude for uh, Techstars, for all the mentors, the associates, for Lars, um, for the whole Rue Institute and the whole program and Governor, everybody here hosting us. Thank you. All right. Great job. Thank Congratulations, you. Hannes. So, Hannes, this past weekend, I was in northern Michigan with my cousin, who's a big Wim Hof guy, mm -hmm. and he made me jump in the lake. It was 40 degrees. And uh, that got me breathing, for sure. And um, <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just curious, is, is this the kind of thing that uh, it seems a little bit rigorous almost, mm -hmm. but I mean, I assume you can dial this down or dial it up depending on how serious you are, right? Oh, yes, yeah, it's like deep breaths are generally a good thing, but as you mentioned, like Wim Hof has been a huge inspiration also to bring breathing and mindfulness into people's life, and now he's like well known and yeah, a huge inspiration. But the, um, great, the great thing that uh, I think, if you don't have time to do a meditation or the discipline, you can take a deep breath. It doesn't take very long. There's even eye blinking exercises, and that mm -hmm. can, has been shown to reduce stress. So right. whatever you can afford to invest during your work day, um, you can afford, you'll, you'll get, a, you'll get an, a, a relaxation exercise that'll help you. Yeah, that's true. And we're using, oh, sorry. It, but it's not really meditation, right? It's, it's, it's just yes. taking a moment to take a breath. It's just what we did, which has some great value, doesn't it? 
Yes, exactly. And we can use machine learning to actually feed us back our own data for our own well-being. And we're also partnering with the Institute for Experiential AI here at the RU. And um, we already started getting support by Maine Technology Institute and local engineering companies to use machine learning to bring more mindfulness with simple exercises to people's lives. Great. All right. Good luck, Hannes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next is the one company in the cohort who uh, was based in Maine before um, the, the program. And I'm gonna introduce Sean Meredith from Omnic Data that are providing insights by analyzing gameplay in the eSports sports uh, world to provide coaching insights to improve performance. In other words. Two hundred and twenty million. There were two hundred and twenty million viewers this year for the League of Legends World Championships. That's sixty million more than the Super Bowl. For those of you that aren't familiar with League of Legends, it's a team-based competitive video game, an esport. And esports are now played competitively and for profit in what has become the world's largest spectator sport. They're televised on networks such as BBC, Fox, and ESPN. Now imagine if you were the only NFL team that didn't use statistics or coaches. <laughs> Ironically, esports are digital games, but they lack the digital data for player performance improvement. Coaches are the same age as the players, and they're using anecdotal feedback instead of data-driven coaching. Traditional sports teams have dozens of analysts and coaches to help them scout, recruit, train, and win. Esports teams have lacked the ability to use Moneyball type techniques until now. I'm Sean Meredith, CEO and co founder of Omnic Data. And Omnic Data provides the player performance analysis for the world's 1.8 billion esports players, analysts, coaches, and aspiring gamers so that they can activate their superpowers and increase their profits. And when that data scales, it's of enormous value to wholesale participants, such as advertisers, leagues, merchandisers, and their investors. We've spent two years developing and training our AI engine based off of similar techniques that I used in my plasma physics research at MIT. The rest of our team consists of successful serial entrepreneurs from Apple and elsewhere and world-class advisors. The Omnic Data Engine has been trained on thousands of hours of video gameplay from over 140 professional players. Using artificial intelligence for our analysis provides us flexibility over our competitors who are limited by the publisher's data feeds. We've established customer partnerships during the program at Techstars with one club, two collegiate teams, and two professional teams, including the two-time world champions, San Francisco Shock. Anyone can use our simple web-based interface. The, since the Omnic Engine uses video of gameplay, they can simply upload a video, or better yet, connect their Twitch or YouTube gaming account. We provide a distraction-free post-match analysis with detailed statistics and actionable insights for player performance improvement. We also provide team insights that a player can use to coordinate, practice, and scrimmage with their team to improve the team's performance. We offer a freemium subscription-based service. Anyone can upload one match for free. The Omnic Engine generates a professional-looking digital player card that can be shared on social media. Each social share gives the user credits towards more match analyses or invitations for their friends. Our tiered pricing plan offers different types of reports, analytics, and statistics based on that price tier. The plans cover the full spectrum from individual gamers to clubs to collegiate teams to professional teams. So whether you're an aspiring gamer that wants bragging rights with their friends, or to get a collegiate esports scholarship, increase your team's winnings, 
or even win the Overwatch League Cup. Omnic Data provides the player performance analysis so the world's 1.8 billion esports players can activate their superpowers. We are Omnic Data, your AI esports coach, and we're building the global provider of esports performance analytics right here in Maine. Thanks for the applause. Good job. Good job. So, um, business is pretty fast moving, and I heard late breaking news. You got uh, another deal to talk about, right? Yeah, actually, interesting. Right before taking the stage, um, through the magic of Techstars, we're, we're announcing a partnership with another Techstars company in the Minnesota Accelerator, Beyond Ranked, and we'll have access to their 5,000 community esports members in a cross promotional All right, game. excellent. So, Sean, you can say OK Boomer to me right now, but this is the, this is the biggest sport I didn't know really existed. What's the, the 220, what, what, how did this happen? Um, <laughs> honestly, uh, uh, eSports and, and video games have been one of the largest industries, kind of a sleeper industry to most people, but you'll, you know, they've greatly exceeded in the last five years, um, even those typical uh, media type industries such as movies and you know Netflix even. It's just amazing to me that baseball of all things had Moneyball before this which is all about technology even thought about it. That's true but it took baseball a hundred years and <laughs> we think esports have three to five and we want to be providing that information. All right Sean. All right good job. Before I go on, I have to, this is kind of an inside joke, so I may get, only get one laugh out of this, but when I joked about breaking um, Ely's arm, I did not break that arm, and I do not believe in violence in the workplace. Okay. The rest of you can ask me later. Um, <clears throat> next up is Phase Zero, who are building a, a patient relationship management system with a no-code solution that helps health tech startups um, manage data associated with the patients or clients that they're working with. So I'd like to introduce now Lee. Hi, my name is Now, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Phase Zero. And I'm here today with my technical co-founder, marathon partner, and slightly messy roommate, Kevin. Kevin and I spent the last three years working with each other at Ovation, a health tech startup. And during the pandemic, we saw companies scramble to move their care virtual, and thousands of patient portals, scheduling applications, and telehealth solutions popped up one after the other. We realized the pandemic accelerated a digital health revolution where virtual care comes first. In 2021 alone, digital health funding surpassed $20 billion, a 3x increase from 2019 with over 500 health tech startups funded in the past year. And all these startups share the same problem. Their patient records need to be stored in a way that complies with HIPAA, a regulatory framework to ensure that patient data is audited and secured. But in practice, many of them are using non-compliant spreadsheets, calendars, and email to maintain and transmit patient data. At Phase Zero, we built a patient relationship management system, empowering digital health companies with the infrastructure they need to start or scale their business, all without writing a single line of code or worrying about HIPAA compliance. For example, we're working with a startup in New York City who provides online care for their patients. Before using Phase Zero, we used to joke that their application was duct taped together with a hodgepodge of Excel, Google Calendar, and email. Their CEO, Sarah, realized that she needed to invest in tech, but she didn't like her initial set of options. She could have outsourced her tech to an expensive development team or buy an expensive electronic health record system that would take months and months to launch. But Sarah chose phase zero, and she got her company live on the platform within a week with the confidence that her patient's care plan, communication, and virtual visits were all compliant. And we're able to do this because not only is our platform out of the box, but we provide extensible integrated components like email, scheduling, and telehealth that can easily plug and play into our system. 
And at the end of the day, we built a patient relationship management system, similar to how other companies might build customer relationship systems using applications like HubSpot. And if you didn't get that reference, our customers can build their own patient relationship management system just like a Build-A-Bear, which Lars had never heard of until. <laughs> and Sarah is not alone. Sarah's company is one of thousands started during the COVID-19 pandemic. The digital therapeutics market size is 2.8 billion and is expected to grow to over 13 billion by 2027. These startups range from mental health tracking to gastrointestinal coaching and even menopause care. And many of them are being started by non-technical clinicians. Phase zero's no-code solution can help all of them. And our business model is closely tied to their success. We charge a per patient fee, so as their business grows, we grow. And we've seen some early success with our work. During the past three months in Techstars alone, we signed six customer contracts and generate over 30 qualified leads. Kevin and I are the right team to do this. I earned my MBA from Northwestern and had had over 10 years of experience leading product for growth stage startups. And Kevin's a phenomenal engineering leader. He was the first engineering hire at Ovation, setting that company up for success, which has now grown over 70 employees and raised their Series B. Phase Zero's mission is to help digital health companies build out their internal tooling, including patient management and care coordination, so they can focus on what matters most, the patient experience. Thank you. I also, I wanted to call Kevin up to the stage because while we were doing this, he's been sitting there with his laptop. We just launched UPenn and he's been troubleshooting an issue, so. Uh, good. Well, good job now. Tell, tell, while we're waiting for Kevin to come up here, I know you guys spent a little bit of time marketing in the old-fashioned way, a little bit of shoe leather here in uh, Portland. How did that, let's say hi to Kevin. Okay. Uh, I'm not my tip now. I would ask. So how was that, door to door? Did that go well? Oh, everyone's so nice in Portland. <laughs> we were going door to door. We'd stand out there really nervous, and we'd loiter. And they would come out and say, hey, can we help you? Come in. Would you like a coffee? And we're like, whoa. Where else in the world would we get people like this? Did you close some deals? We got 12 business cards. That's good. Mm -hmm. good. We're working on closing we're them. Yeah. <laughs> Those are 12 of the 30. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we talked a lot about John the neighbor. <laughs> but somebody had to be the first neighbor, the sort of neighbor zero, right? Was phase zero neighbor zero? Kevin and I were fortunate enough to live right below neighbor John, so you could say we were neighbor zero. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, good luck with it. Thank you so much. What they've done as a team is really remarkable. Um, I'm, so I haven't said that about other companies, but I think the technology that they've built very quickly is amazing. Um, next up, uh, 10x. Noah King has built a platform that allows smaller companies to have access to market research in a kind of a lean way that they haven't been able to access before because it's been too expensive. Noah. If you've ever seen the TV show Mad Men, you probably have a picture in your head that working in advertising is glamorous. It's actually changed quite a bit since then. Um, nowadays, people go out of their way to avoid ads. And I get it. I worked in advertising for 10 years. Uh, but I'm, I'm one of the few people that actually loved the experience because I got to work with some of the world's biggest brands on some really incredible projects. But most importantly, in that experience, I walked away with one key learning. Behind every brilliant idea and successful product launch, there was always a ton of smart market research. But here's the problem with doing market research. It's really hard. It costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. And you need to have a huge amount of experience to know where to start. So that's why for small companies, for startups, for local businesses, it's never been an option. They've been priced out. But that's about to change. I'm here today to tell you about a 10x. We took the essence of big brand market research 
and we shrunk it down into a tiny package that any company can afford. We call it lean research. And with our lean research product, any company can start learning from their customers in real time for as little as $100. And now is a really important time for us to focus our attention on small companies. That's because platforms like Shopify and Instagram have popularized this do-it-yourself model for marketing. These are platforms that have enabled millions of companies to quickly and easily take their ideas and bring them to market. But that's been without the benefit of market research. So if you add in a 10x, those same millions of companies don't just go to market quickly and rushed, they go to market with market research insights, and they know things like the right price, the right positioning, the right audience, and they have all the elements that they need to succeed. We've built a software product that simplifies market research and automates all the hardest parts of it. Everything from campaign management, panel recruitment, and even insights generation. And it's not just about recruiting panelists. We have a really novel way of engaging and rewarding people for their participation. Here's the thing. There are a lot of survey sites out there. I want to be clear, we did not build another survey site. We built a research platform. The difference is, if you want to get an insight, you need to find the right people, and you need to ask them the right questions. And if you want an insight that you can bet your business on, you need to work with a platform that eliminates bias. These are challenges that we profoundly understand and that we've solved for, and it's a giant opportunity. Every year, there's $75 billion being spent globally on market research and insights. And that number is going to get a lot bigger once small companies get a seat at the table. Speaking of small companies, most people don't realize it. 80% of Facebook's ad revenue today comes from small and medium businesses. That's over $70 billion this past year. And the same is true for Google. For Google, 90% of their ad revenue comes from small, medium businesses. So this is a huge opportunity right now. So speaking of our revenue, we have a very healthy business model. As I've mentioned, working with these small companies, we run research on our platform, and that's a source of sustainable SaaS revenue from a subscription model. In addition to that, we take the results from that research, we package it into an audience product, and we can sell that data again to enterprise businesses. Our platform has been live this past year, and we've had awesome traction so far. We've worked with 15 companies as part of our beta, including the Portland Sea Dogs, <laughs> thanks to the Rue. <laughs> we've recruited uh, more than 2,000 panelists to participate in that research, and since being in Techstars, uh, our sales pipeline has exploded. It's grown over 400%, and we're just about to kick off an expanded effort with sales, marketing, and partnerships. We are the right team to change what's possible with market research. I've been leading product teams and consumer research teams at agencies my whole career. And we have built a team of research experts, marketing veterans, and of course, software engineers. A 10X is the world's first do-it-yourself market research platform guided by experts. Lean research is the one thing that millions of companies have needed and had to wait for until now. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Perfect. Good job, Noah. Thank you. So uh, the Sea Dogs, huh? Tell us, what, what do you got cooking for them? Uh, yeah, so we ran a project with them uh, while we were here in the program. Um, so as the Rue promised, they said, you know, we really believe in Portland. We really believe in these companies. We want to make intros. And Riley, who uh, works on the Rue team, actually used to work at the Sea Dogs. And he walked me right in the door, uh, became very close with Dennis over there, and uh, we helped them figure out their 2022 uh, ticket strategy. You get the sense that everybody knows everybody here. You know, it's kind of like that Kevin Bacon thing. <laughs> Main Kevin Bacon thing. It's not even five degrees. It's like two degrees, probably, right? There's a lot of really kind people, and I think uh, Portland is the gift that keeps on giving. 
All right, but tell me about this lean research. That means there's a lot of fat research out there. I mean, it, what, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, oh, is, is, there, is this just waste writ large? There, uh, there's a lot of big companies that charge a lot of money, and there's a lot of mega brands that can afford it because they see the value. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really excited by what's, what's been changed with a platform like Shopify, and we really feel like uh, this is ripe for disruption. All right, good luck. Thank you. And you're relocating to what state? So I'm one of the businesses that is setting up shop here in Maine. Uh, we, uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Go see dogs. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, next up we have Fauci Bachi with um, MC Squared Health who are improving the patient billing experience by making your medical bills readable and easy to pay. And candidate, I mean, Hannes is up there, but candidate for the uh, best dressed CEO award, I think. <laughs> and keep in mind, you will be voting on this uh, later because it's a very, it's the way we select who we invest in. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, no, 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 that's California. We're in Maine. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Every year, patients are billed over $400 billion for healthcare services that they receive. 62% of patients never pay their bills in full, resulting in over $42 billion of lost revenue to providers. In no other industry is such a large number of billables completely written off. But at the same time, there's no industry that's quite like healthcare where patients never see a price tag and have to wait up to six weeks after a service, on average, to receive a bill. As a former clinic manager, I used to experience my patients' pain every time I handed them a Kleenex while walking them through a complex medical bill. That's why we built this technology, because we know that providers want to do better. Because when patients can't pay their bills, everybody loses. That includes patients, employers, and providers. Hi, I'm Ashi Bachu, founder and CEO of MC Squared Health. And along with Trevor Peace, our head of engineering, we have over 30 years of combined healthcare and payments experience. We're using that knowledge to build a patient-centric billing solution that works for everyone. As we all know, complex medical bills have always been a thing, particularly with patient bills. So why did we choose to start working on this problem today? In the past 10 years, the amount that patients have owed has more than doubled, due in large part to high deductible health plans. Yet the way in which we're billing patients has largely remained the same. 86% of bills are still sent to patients via paper. We have to find a better way to bill patients. And we all know that patients maybe don't pay their bills for many reasons, but what we learned is that patients do want to pay their bills. So we had a radical idea. Let's trust patients to design payment plans that work for them. Enter MC Squared Health. Our HIPAA-compliant billing solution integrates directly with practices and doctors, allowing them to digitally bill, track, receive payment, and transfer funds. Our flexible solution can be customized to meet the needs of providers. For patients, they receive a bill link through which they can view their bill in great detail. They can make a payment or set up a payment plan. But what does all of this really mean? We eliminate all of the complexity when it comes to payment friction, enabling patients to pay in ways that work for them using credit cards, debit cards, and bank transfers. Now, imagine that in getting a complex, jumbled up mess of a bill like this, you could get a bill like this. And the best part, we work directly on behalf of providers. 
That means freeing up doctors to spend more time with patients as opposed to chasing them down for bills. In the past you know, few years, COVID-19 has had a substantial impact, financially particularly, for practices. In many cases, practices have actually had to close down due to financial insolvency. But in that same time period, we've actually launched in three practices. And in our first practice, we increased revenue from 62% to over 95% and kept it that way for six consecutive months. We generate revenue through uh, monthly contracts with our customers. As we continue to grow, we look forward to partnering with hospitals and healthcare systems, enabling them to increase their collection speed and decrease their bad debt. The bottom line, MC Squared Health works with the medical community, allowing them to improve their billing processes so they could increase their collections and keep their doors open for their patients and their community. Thank you. So, Good job. Thank you. Ashley, congratulations. You, um, I think you get a uh, Medal of Courage for diving in to what we call a system, the healthcare system. I, would, I don't know if it is a system, but to try to sort that out and simplify things. Uh, you weren't at all daunted by that prospect and that challenge? You know, it's kind of one of those things where I had seen so many patients come in with so many different kinds of issues that at some point you see what feels like the complete edges of the map, that you feel like you've seen everything. And at that point, you can't just let it keep happening. You have to step in and do something about it. So that was kind of my experience. I just had to do something at that but, point. But it's so complicated and Byzantine. Do you feel, like, can, you, can you tackle this one? We're going to do the best that we can. Now, Ashi, you're from California, I know. <laughs> Ooh, California. That everybody's perfect. <laughs> uh, but uh, tell us about your main plan. Yeah, so um, first of all, I have to thank one of my wonderful mentors, uh, Dr. Jennifer Monte. She actually uh, offered up uh, a guest house, uh, which was wonderfully sweet of her. Um, but little did she know that we had actually been in conversations like the, just the night before with about you know, five or six companies in our cohort to figure out if we could actually put together some kind of a startup house that we could all live and work out of together so we could continue this experience forward. So it's been just an absolute pleasure with everybody here. Um, and we're just trying to keep that energy and, and momentum going. So even if you're going to live in California, you'll still be coming back to Maine to get your work done. That's exactly the plan. All right, all right. Okay, next we have Max. <laughs> Say your name again. Max Echeverria. Max Echeverria. <laughs> Max is from Chile, and he is the CEO of uh, eSquad, who are providing remote data collection solutions for field operators and natural resources industries. Yeah, I will help you with your pronunciation later. <laughs> well, mining, forestry, and the maritime sectors are all trillion dollar industries. They rely on millions of field workers spread out in remote areas with unreliable internet service. Over the past 20 years, companies have made significant investments in machines and equipment, and yet, Productivity has stagnated. <laughs> Field workers are still using a very manual, paper-driven process. Yes, they're still using pen and paper. And we've seen it here. Uh, that's the reason why there are so many bad reports, miscommunication, and inefficient planning, which represents 20% of operational cost. These problems can also contribute to accidents and fatalities. And companies, like major companies, that experience problems like this uh, may experience a stoppage which um, it may incur in losses, which make them incur in losses of thousands of hundreds 
sorry, hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour. Let's take, for example, PG&E, where lack of communication between field workers contributed to the Dixie Fire, and now they are being sued for more than a billion dollars. That's why eSquad is here. My name is Max, and I'm the founder and CEO of eSquad, and we're bringing technology to the next frontier in field worker productivity. eSquad is a data platform that helps workers go from pen and paper to automated data processes. It can plug into a company's existing systems to deliver work orders to a specific employee's cell phone regardless of internet service quality. Workers can then respond, gather data manually or automatically, and return the results through the same unreliable internet service. Squad helps with this challenge, that in, in, despite these challenges, these results in significant improvements in turnaround time, reducing weeks down to days or hours. A squad, it's a win-win. Workers can focus on their work while managers are happy because they get better data faster, which leads to better, <coughs> um, basically huge savings in both time and money. Before tech starts, we prove our solution works. It's right there, working. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we prove it in Chile with some of the top maritime and forestry companies that are customers right now paying and they're a subscription model. We won also is, um, the most innovative solution award by Startup Chile. So in our country, we're an industry leader and we came to America to prove if our solution and business model would apply here. And it did. In the past few weeks, we have engaged with logging, maritime, uh, forestry, and environmental organizations, and we're working with them, proving that we can address the $150 billion market opportunity. By the way, improving and automating data collection is just the first step in our offering. Our technology will provide better connectivity, leading to real-time data, and we're already fitting um, predictive models that can help save lives reduce injuries, and also lower insurance costs. And I know our team is the best team to provide this solution. I have, I have experience in mining, forestry, as well as um, in field operations, like working there, <laughs> in operations research, and innovation for those industries. Also, my team it consists of some of the top executives and engineers from my country, from Chile, who I met while building and then selling two of my companies. So come join our, uh, come join our e squad, sorry, come join our S squad. <laughs> <laughs> and let's empower teamwork anywhere. Good job, brother. Okay, so. I'm trying to get it. You're, you're, um, you're going to the woods. These guys are chopping down a tree. The tree goes to the paper mill to make paper, and you're trying to tell them not to use paper. Yep. How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, paper is old school. They're not only about paper. They're most of the products, in this case, is for like construction. But also, they are working on, uh, with lignin, you can produce uh, plastic, bioplastics. Also, you can produce biochar, which is being done here in Maine. So basically, uh, there's a lot more than only paper in that industry. But, but I, I saw an email that you got from one of your prospects, and at the end of the email it says, please print this email as many times as you would like. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we need to help them to be more productive. Yeah. <laughs> now, now you, you have spent quite a bit of time getting to know people in the, the lumber community here in Maine. What's that been like? Um, it's awesome. I mean, they're friendly. They're, open, they're opening their doors. I, presented my solution in front of a bunch of them, like last week. Uh, this week I went to the forest with them, so <laughs> they're eager for that, and my pipeline shows it. <laughs> All right, excellent, it's a recurring you, theme. And you're sticking around in Maine? We don't have a home in the US, so we call this a home, and it <laughs> has been a home for us, so yeah, I would say, <laughs> I would say so. All right, awesome. good job, Thanks. good luck, guys. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
And lastly, we have Jess Litch from Wishroute, who, are, who is using a uh, human text coach. What does that mean? A human on providing coaching through SMS by real humans to reinforce the behaviors that make them want to use wellness products that they signed up for and maybe haven't used as much as they want to. That's a very bad explanation. You'll do, be you'll do better, Jess. So? <laughs> I hope so, she says. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jess Lynch, and I'm the CEO and founder of Wishrout. We all have aspirational goals for ourselves, to work out daily, to save money for a trip, to learn a new language. People download apps to help them with these goals over 14 billion times a year. But the reality is 70% of people stop engaging within three days of downloading them which means they don't benefit from any kind of free trial and almost certainly don't convert to paying customers. This leaves over $60 billion on the table for these apps. I reflected on my own life experiences and realized what's missing is the personal support and accountability people need to adopt new products and benefit from them. That's why I founded Wishroute. We enable wellness apps, consumer apps, and subscription products to convert and retain more customers by engaging with new users via text message, offering motivation and accountability through human conversation. 98% of texts are opened within three minutes. And because there's a human being on the other side that understands your goals, challenges, and can help you stay motivated, it's a winning combination. Unlike a purely bot-driven service that gives people the illusion of communication, but leads to frustration when the bot doesn't understand the context and nuance of what you're saying, Wishroute's unique human-powered platform combines the best of technology and human involvement to provide real two-way coaching at scale. We strategically nudge people forward along the company's desired path, helping people and companies reach their goals for the company, increasing their free-to-paid conversion rate, just one percentage point, can mean over $100,000 in new revenue. To date, our customers, by adding Wishrout, have been able to increase their free-to-paid conversion 20% and sustain engagement 11 times higher than your average app. In terms of how it works, when users sign up for our customers' products, their information gets passed to Wishroute so we can send texts and support them. Our revenue comes from a SaaS subscription based on the number of users our customers have. And companies, though, of all sizes choose us because we're the experts in proactive coaching, provide the scalable gig workforce of coaches, and have the smart proprietary platform ready to drive a clear and measurable ROI. Our coaching methodology was developed using behavioral science research, and we'll use machine learning to put it into action so our coaches can efficiently focus on what matters, adding nuance and context to the conversation. Our algorithms will get smarter over time and bring just the right mix of automation and human touch to convert and retain customers affordably. We're starting by focusing on the $3 billion US wellness app market, but Keeping customers engaged isn't only important for wellness apps. It's also critical for product subscriptions, e-learning, personal finance, healthcare, and anywhere companies need to provide a friendly nudge to keep customers on the right track. Our team brings expertise in scaling companies, technology, strategy, and behavior change, and through Techstars have proven we can execute. We've raised a pre-seed round, built the first version of our product, are working with paying customers, and we have over 40 top health and wellness brands in our pipeline excited to work with us. We're on a mission to make customer engagement and support radically more personal. Now for the first time, companies can text you like a friend does, check in and help you reach your goals so they can reach theirs. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Yay.
Fantastic. Nice. So now, uh, like Omnic, you've got some late-breaking data, too. You signed a really big new customer. Yes, Tell us about we that. did. The largest uh, yoga brand. They're a public company in the U.S., and we're going to be working with them um, starting early next year. All right. Namaste. Yeah. Namaste. Yeah. So I'm curious who these little angels are that are going to be in my life telling me... <laughs> You could call it nagging, but it's a, you know, <laughs> friendly prodding, nudge, nudging. friendly nudge uh, to keep me on track. Who are yeah. these people and how do you find them? Great question. It's really fulfilling work for people who struggle to find remote, flexible, part-time evening uh, work. And so we found aligned communities that really value this type of work and are naturally instincting, you know, their instincts are to encourage and care and support other people. And so we're actually really focused right now on finding Wish Route Guides in Maine so that we can keep you know, the connection to Maine as strong as possible. So it's better than Uber. Right? Yeah. Or, or uh, screening you know, risky content. Like, that's not that fun. So I have, I have this idea for future growth for you guys. What, what if you recruited a group of people who would encourage vices? Like, you know, <laughs> go ahead, and have another piece of pie. <laughs> One more beer, it's OK. You know, there could be some growth there. Just say it. We do personalize based on the user, so we may learn that's what you respond to and actually adjust. But. <laughs> All right, good luck, Jess. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yay, I'm so excited. Oh, good to be here. Wow, well, I expected it to go well. I did not expect it to go that well. You guys knocked it out of the park. Aside from, uh, aside from me, I don't think there was a stumble in there. That's great. Um, OK, so this has been a 13-week program, but Techstars is a network for life. This is just the beginning of the process. Um, we have relationships with companies who have gone through the program for years and years. We are shareholders in the companies on the same terms as the founders themselves. We consider ourselves to be founders in these companies, to be co-founders along with the founding teams. And we're in it for the long haul. Um, and that's what it means to go through this program. It's not a one-time 13-week hit where you graduate, and that's that. It's the start of a long, productive, healthy relationship, we hope. And so I'd like to end by thanking them for your hard work, but also, um, you know, it takes the right kind of personality to benefit from this program. You need some humility and some vulnerability. Uh, if I said during the screening, if you, know exact, if you think you've got it exactly right and you want to take 13 weeks and just build it, this is not the program for you. So it takes, takes the attitude of wanting to learn, wanting to listen to mentors, being open to feedback, and being part of a team. Because it's not just working with the Techstars team, but you guys together have become a team on your own. It was remarkable to see cross-functional, cross-company collaboration on so many, so many projects. Um, it was very gratifying, and I know that you're looking for ways to keep in touch uh, after the program ends as well. Um, <clears throat> so I hope you feel like you got a value from Techstars and the program, but I want you all to know just how much value you have given back um, to me personally, uh, to the community you're a part of, and I don't think there's a mentor without exception that just says, thank you, this was so much fun. Just to see the energy and enthusiasm that you're bringing to these new ventures uh, has been reinvigorating and inspiring for folks during this difficult Zoomy time, sitting behind screens and doing the same job in and out. Um, and in the years to come, I look forward to working with the Rue Institute again. This is the first year of many, I hope. Uh, it's a great partnership. And I think, uh, I, I hope it serves as a model for how educational institutions can integrate with the entrepreneurial ecosystem and foster it. And we can really have a tight partnership that doesn't draw a line between entrepreneurship and business and education, but molds the two into a more efficient system, ecosystem. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris Mallett to bring us home. I, I'm supposed to say Chris Mallett from the room. <laughs> Thanks, Lars. I feel like I'm trying to wrap up the Academy Awards following this lineup of speakers today, but um, it's my pleasure to try and do so, and I'll, I'll try to do the opportunity justice. I want to begin with some gratitude and thanks. Uh, most importantly, thanks to all of you who've come to be with us today. We have more than 250 people here in the room and a few hundred watching with us online around the world. 
And you're every bit as much a part of the success and the support for these founders as any of the rest of us. And we appreciate you coming out today to be a part of it. I want to thank those that, uh, that began the program, my colleague Margaret Angel and Rich Miner, for your wonderful and welcoming remarks that set the tone for the day. I want to thank Lars and Miles, the entire Rue Institute team, and the Techstars team, both on the stage and behind the scenes that made today's events possible and happen. It's been a phenomenal production. Governor Mills, you mentioned uh, in your remarks, uh, you joined us at the Rue Institute to welcome the first uh, class of graduate learners at the peak of the pandemic last September. In a Zoom meeting at 7 p.m., Governor Mills joined us to welcome 75 learners to the Rue Institute who had made a commitment and taken a risk on their future. That's how much she cares about the Rue Institute and the opportunity that it's created. Your remarks today set the tone of inspiration, and I want to thank you for your support for the Institute, for these founders, and quite frankly, for your um, courageous leadership these last two years to help keep all of us here in Maine safe and well. <laughs> Most importantly, I want to thank these founders. This has been an unbelievable afternoon. Each of you have just demonstrate, uh, demonstrated the courage and the inspiration and the passion that, uh, that is moving you to pursue your next best effort, your mission, and, and fulfill your promise for your company. And as Lars mentioned in his opening remarks, that's what we're trying to do at the Rue Institute as well. Uh, we're part of a, a more than century old university, Northeastern University, and we're working here in Portland, Maine as a startup. Northeastern is a global university system. We operate campuses in 13 global cities, Seattle, London, Boston, and for the past two years, right here in Portland, Maine. We serve more than 40,000 learners, faculty, and staff around the world. And when we operate here in Portland, we operate as the Rue Institute at Northeastern University. What makes the Rue Institute special is a commitment and a focus on partnership. Partnership has been another theme that surfaced all afternoon. These, group, these founders themselves have partnered with one another and apparently may live together to continue that partnership and in order to help um, uh, fulfill their next potential. And the Rue Institute was born of and, and is the product of a very unique and special partnership, a partnership between David and Barbara Rue, as Governor Mills mentioned, Mainers themselves who had a vision and have a vision for Maine's future economy fueled by the tech and the life sciences, a partnership between the Rue family, Northeastern University, and the Harold Alphon Foundation. We haven't talked much about the foundation today, but you all know how important that organization is to the state of Maine. The Harold Alphon Foundation matched the Rue family's $100 million investment to create uh, the Rue Institute at Northeastern University, and they've specifically asked that that resource make uh, education possible for Mainers. 67 million in scholarships over the next 10 years, and additional funding to recruit top scientists to participate at the Rue Institute and to help founders and, and partners such as these. The partnership between the Rue's, Northeastern, and the Harold Alphon Foundation laid the, uh, laid the, the groundwork for what's become uh, the Rue Institute at Northeastern University, and we've extended it in partnership with more than 80 organizations small and large businesses here in Maine, nearly every college and university in Maine, and community and civic leaders and NGOs throughout the state. And that's because this mission that we're on of economic development in Maine is just too challenging and too complex and too important for any organization to try to go it alone. So we're grateful at the Rue Institute for the partnership of all of you, the people who are here in this room, for the partnership of our 80 partners and the leaders of our community who are creating opportunities such as this. And these founders too know the value of partnership. You've demonstrated it in your talks today and in your knocking on doors and in your work with organizations and your willingness to kind of listen and be humble as Lars suggested, to be inspired and informed uh, by partners who can help shape your uh, next steps and your next products. And we hope that that partnership will continue uh, as you grow your organizations. And I'll also share that you also now have partners in all of us. We're all your partners. And as Lars mentioned, you're part of the Tech Stars Network for Life. 
You're also part of the Rue Institute and Northeastern Family for Life and your honorary Mainers, whether you uh, uh, choose to locate here or not forever. So thank you. As we close our program, I, I, I'd like to ask um, uh, all of the founders and members of the team to join us near here the stage. And then if I could ask Lars and Miles, could you also join us at the stage? And Margaret and Rich, please join us at the stage. Governor Mills, Mayor Snyder, and Commissioner Johnson, would you please join us at the stage? As today's, uh, as today's experience uh, has demonstrated and proven, um, it takes collaboration, partnership, and a lot of hard work in a full community to create success. Please join me in congratulating and celebrating the Rue Tech Stars Class of 2021. Thank you, everyone. So this concludes uh, the demo day portion of today's uh, program.